So I'm going to talk about the structural attacks on block ciphers. This is a work we, we have been doing uh, since roughly five years, and I'm going to, uh, to go through uh, most of this. <coughs> so it's uh, structured into uh, three uh, parts. I'm going to motivate first uh, the problem, and then I'm going to talk about invariant subspace attacks, which is a kind of attack that we invented. And then the generalization of this, which is nonlinear uh, invariant attack, and then finally, if time allows, I'm going to talk about how to avoid these attacks. So how to choose your block cipher so that it's not vulnerable to these attacks. So um, what is the context? The context is uh, lightweight cryptography. So um, lightweight cryptography <coughs> is a very um, uh, hot topic since uh, maybe also 10 years. Many, we, we have seen many uh, uh, new block ciphers popping up. And uh, the interesting thing is that most of them, because lightweight cryptography, you, you want cryptography which is very, uh, very um, cheap to implement, very uh, efficient. And this means that uh, many people started to do more aggressive designs, so no um, security, uh, <coughs> so no security margin and uh, less standard designs. And the main advantage of this, in my perspective, is not that we have all these designs, which probably most of them are not useful, but the nice thing is that uh, these designs show us uh, a lot more insight about how to design or how to not to design block ciphers. So this is what I, what I like about the topic. <coughs> okay, so this is a block cipher. I'm not going to uh, speak a lot about this. Um, <coughs> this is... Uh, what's called a key alternating cipher, and this is what I'll focus on in the talk. So you have a key scheduling um, that produces round keys, and then <coughs> you have different round, round functions, <coughs> which are normally uh, the same up to maybe adding a constant, and you have uh, round keys that are XORed uh, between the rounds. And the advanced encryption standard is one of those, and also the Russian, uh, I, I cannot pronounce the name of this uh, Russian, with uh, also the Russian standard is of this form. So I did not adapt these uh, slides uh, to be more Russian, so I'm more, ma mainly talking about uh, non-Russian ciphers, but uh, most of this also applies to uh, the Russian versions. Um, and, and I'm also going to focus even more on um, these uh, SP networks. So this is where the round function consists of a uh, layer of S-boxes and a linear function. Yeah. So we already heard yesterday about, I think you called it XS, XSL, XSL yeah? so it's basically the same thing. Again, the Russian is, the version is, is like this as well. Okay. So um, just to divide very roughly the, the, the type of attacks, I'm going to divide this into statistical attacks, which includes linear attacks and uh, uh, differential attacks, um, and many more, and, and their variants. So these involve probabilities, they are um, widely applicable, so whenever you, you, have a, you come up with a new block cipher, you should study those attacks and, and show um, that, that they are not applicable to your cipher, and it's not easy to, to avoid those. I mean, we know how to do it, but it's, it's not uh, easy. Yeah? And then there are structural attacks, and structural attacks might be integral attacks, uh, high-order differential attacks, and so on, and those usually hold with probability one. So this is really like a probability, probability one uh, uh, property of the cipher, and it's rather easy to, to avoid those. Eh? If, you, if, you attack those uh, if you detected those, then uh, you know what you, what you should do to, to fix these problems. And I'm going to focus on structural attacks, and moreover on a special type, namely uh, symmetries. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what symmetries, uh, what exactly I mean with symmetries in a minute. <coughs> so, um, what happens often in this lightweight cryptography, but also in other uh, designs, is that the round keys are the same. So the idea is you, you try to reduce the complexity of your ciphers as much as possible, and because we don't really understand what the uh, key scheduling is good for, we just uh, leave it out. So what happens, in what, what you see in many of those designs is that the keys are, are all the same. And the only thing that, that is different from round to round is actually that we have a different round constants. Yeah? And this will be important for, for my talk uh, later. <coughs> so a, qu a natural question you can ask is, if this uh, choosing all the, round counts, uh, all the round keys the same, is this a good idea? You can actually prove that if you, if you use uh, random round constants, 
then this is sound, so it doesn't uh, introduce any uh, significant error, but uh, this is not what we do normally. Yeah? In order to keep things efficient, we, we choose the round constants as sparse, so maybe only a few bits that we change, and this might be uh, critical for uh, when talking about symmetries. So what do I mean with symmetries? So uh, an easy uh, example of symmetries is you have a plain text where the first and the second half are identical, and maybe the key is also of this form, Se is, uh, first and second half of the key are the same. <coughs> then what you don't want is that the ciphertext is always of this form as well. This is certainly nothing that you would like your block cipher to produce. Um, <coughs> and this is also the, key, the, the point where it helps that all the round keys are the same, because if you have a complicated key scheduling, then even if the master keys of this form first and second half are identical, then probably the, the key scaling is going to destroy this property and, and probably the symmetry as well. So one possible abstraction from the symmetries is, is and this is what I'm going to, to talk about, is an, a fine subspace of plain text, which under some weak keys, probably from some, also some uh, a fine subspace, is uh, mapped to, to itself. Yeah? This is what an invariant subspace is. I'm, I'll define it in a minute. <clears throat> well, you can ask if these uh, symmetries are actually attacks, and uh, this uh, depends. So in many cases, if, if the number of uh, weak keys is very small, this is probably not uh, very, very critical. Yeah? I mean, you can always define a, a class of weak keys that do something special. Yeah? Just pick 10 random keys, and then look at the plain text and cipher text, and you will find some, some symmetry of this form. Yeah? So, um, but in all cases, this is certainly something we do not want. So uh, we would like to avoid this. And then the other question you can ask is, do these, these things happen? And so here are examples of ciphers <coughs> with, the, with the year where they've been broken uh, with these kind of symmetries. So it started with print cipher, and then uh, many other ciphers followed. So um, yeah, so these things do happen. Um, Knox is actually the, uh, one of the desi design of Philip, but I think he's still sleeping, so. It's, uh, it's, it's not the final version of this uh, Knox, eh? so this is version two. Um, <coughs> so here, I, <coughs> I, try to, <coughs> I try to plot. So this is the number of designs broken with this attack, and this is the year when they've been broken. Yeah, so in 2011, we had one cipher broken, and then in 2015, more, and in 2016, uh, even more, yeah? So the, I, I plotted this in Excel and asked Excel to extrapolate. So this is what happens. So if Excel is correct, then um, in maybe two, five years from now, we'll have uh, roughly 90 ciphers being broken with this. I don't know what, yeah, I don't know what, uh, where is this? Yeah, and this is uh, 10 years from now, no, this is, I don't know what this is, yeah? Maybe half a cipher gets unbroken again, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Some, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, and then uh, 10 years from now, we'll have uh, roughly 370 ciphers being broken with this attack. So this means, um, this is much more critical than quantum computers, yeah? So quantum computers maybe break all the block ciphers we have, but this actually is going to break more block ciphers than we're going to have, yeah? Because we don't have 350 block ciphers, so. This is uh, really critical. So you better pay attention, yeah? Okay. Good. Okay, now uh, back to a uh, more serious uh, description of this stuff. <coughs> so um, this idea of symmetries and this is abstraction with uh, subspaces was first introduced in uh, 2012. And as I explained, it's, it's going to make uh, use of uh, weak keys that, are, that keep in subspace invariant. <clears throat> so for print cipher, this resulted in a probability one, distinguisher for the full cipher, and this is actually something that's going to happen all the time. If you, if you find this uh, attack, then it's going to be with probability one, and it's going to uh, be applicable for the whole, whole cipher. Yeah. So for print cipher, which is not the best cipher uh, ever, but uh, yeah. so you have two to the 50 out of two to the 80 keys a week, which is uh, significant. I think, and uh, there's another version for pre which has uh, 96 bits input, and, and you have something similar there. So what is the abstraction? 
the abstraction is that if f is the round function of your cipher, <coughs> and all the rounds are the, the same, um, and u is a subspace and a is a constant, so this is an affine subspace, a coset of a subspace. This is mapped uh, to u plus b, so a, a different coset of the same subspace. And then if you have a key which is in this uh, coset, yeah, in u plus a plus b, then if fk is, is the round function including the final xor, after, the, after the, the round function f, it means that u plus a is going to be mapped to u plus a. And if all the round keys are identical, this is uh, going to, to repeat for all rounds and the cipher is broken. So one question, for print cipher we actually uh, looked, I mean it was just we found this by looking at the, at the cipher. Yeah? Which is not very satisfactory because it means you have to carefully look all the time. Yeah? That's uh, annoying. It would be nicer to have an automatic uh, algorithm to detect those things. And this is what I'm going to explain next. So here's the idea again in, 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 in trying to cap capture the idea in a picture. So you have a subspace u plus a being mapped to u plus b, so different uh, coset of the same subspace, and then because of the key addition it's getting mapped back to u plus a, and then this is uh, <coughs> iterative. So it's going to happen for all the rounds. Um, if you have identical round keys. So how, how can we detect those things uh, automatically? So I, in the picture I'm going to represent as uh, squares or uh, rectangles. It's always going to be a subspace while other things are not subspaces. No? So um, the, the, the idea is that we, we try to uh, find the subspace by guessing parts of it and then uh, mapping it back and forth. And so if, if the guess was not correct, that means that our initial um, uh, points were not in the subspace which is invariant, it's going to recover the trivial solution may, may, meaning that the whole subspace uh, of n bit strings is mapped to the whole subspace of n bit strings and um, otherwise it's going to recover uh, the subspace u. So here's the idea. So the only um, <coughs> assumption is that, that you have a round function which is a permutation. Uh, so it's a very mild uh, assumption. And so you can implement f and f inverse uh, efficiently. And then what we do, we guess uh, a subspace within the subspace. So guess some u, some, some part of u, um, and then you're going to map this using f. Yeah? So you just guess some points, you hope they are in the subspace, and you map them using your own function. So you're going to get some, something like this. Yeah? So if this is already a subspace, you're done. Yeah? Because then you found the subspace which is invariant under f. If this is not the subspace, then you know all this should be included in this subspace u. So you can look at the linear span of this. You look at the linear span and this is what in the picture I'm going to, uh, yeah, so this is supposed to be the smallest subspace uh, containing uh, all these elements. Yeah? And then you're going to map this back again. Yeah? And you're going to get, again, get uh, some set. If it's a subspace already, you're done. If not, then you're going to look at again at the linear span of this. Yeah? And you're going to map it again and do it again and again and again, and at some point this is going to stabilize. If your guess was correct, this is going to stabilize, and this means you found an invariant subspace. So it's very simple. Um, okay, so the, the idea is very simple, and, and of course there are like uh, details that I'm omitting now. You're not going to map, map the whole subspace uh, all the time because this is going to exp be too expensive, but you just map a few random elements back and forth. Um, <coughs> but basically this, uh, this is the idea. So it's going to stabilize and, and you find your uh, subspace. Okay, clear? Okay. Good. So what is the running time of this algorithm? It's very simple, but it's actually also quite expensive. So what, what you have to guess, to, uh, the, the main thing is that you have to get uh, many possibilities for the initial guess, yeah. for your uh, elements in the subspace. So <coughs> you have to guess the offset. And you have to guess uh, uh, at least uh, two elements in the subspace. J just guessing one element in the subspace is going to be mapped to one element, and this is, uh, uh, of course, a, a zero-dimensional uh, coset. This is uh, not meaningful. So that means you basically have to guess three elements, and um, because if, if you assume that the subspace we, we want to find is of dimension d, then this is running time two to the three n times d, n minus d, where n is the block size, and d is the dimension of the subspace we want to find. So this is uh, very expensive. 
Um, one uh, important improvement is that if, if you have a, a block cipher where all the round keys are identical and the rounds only differ by adding round constants, you can easily see that the round constants actually have to be in the subspace. Yeah. In order to work for all rounds, all the, sub, uh, all the round constants have to be in the subspace. And this means that you don't have to guess this initial thing, but just take the round constants to be uh, in the subspace. And then the only thing you have to guess is uh, the offset, so the, the A. Where, where the translation of this subspace. And um, again, so this reduces it from 2, two to the 3 n minus d to 2 to the n minus d, um, which in, in, in cases where n is not too big, so we've been focusing on 64 bit block ciphers, and maybe we'll, we're looking for a, a, a subspace of dimension 32. This is running time 2 to the 32, so that's uh, very well doable. Okay, let's look at uh, one example. <coughs> And the example I'm focusing on is these LS designs. Um, so these, the main idea uh, of this design was actually something that is easy to mask. So when, when you want to have a block cipher and you want to implement this, then uh, it's important to care about um, uh, side channel attacks. And in order to avoid these side channel attacks, you probably want to uh, include masking in the implementation of your cipher. And uh, so the idea of these LS designs is to already uh, know that masking is not going to be too expensive. Okay. So what they do is actually something which is uh, kind of opposite of what is usually done. So namely, uh, normally you would maybe have table lookups for the S-boxes and you're going to implement the linear layer by uh, some logical operations and they do the reverse of this. So they use tables for the linear layer and uh, a few logical operations for the uh, S-box, which is going to help in, in masking. And there are two instances, uh, Robin and its uh, authenticated encryption variant Ice Cream and Phantomas and Scream. So why the names? Um, so the ciphers are easy to mask. Yeah? And Robin, you know, the little brother of uh, Batman, yeah. he has a mask. And Phantomas uh, also has a mask. Yeah? Phantomas is the, like the French version, I think, of, uh, of all this stuff. Yeah? So, okay. It's not my idea. Yeah? Um, so this is how it basically works. I'm going to look at the uh, reduced version of this, uh, this stuff. So this is uh, 64 bits, I guess. And uh, one square corresponds to one bit of the cipher. And uh, you're going to store columns in registers if you want to implement this in software. The columns are going to be um, stored in registers. So you have S boxes working in this direction. So you have S boxes applied to, in the, uh, uh, to, the, to the rows. And how you're going to implement this? Now the columns are uh, within the register. So you, you, the natural idea how to implement this S box layer is the bit slicing. And we heard about uh, yesterday about uh, bit slicing already. Yeah, I think you you talked about this. Yeah? So. Um, <coughs> This is uh, how you would implement this, and, and there, therefore it's important that there's only a few logical operations, because otherwise it's going to be expensive. And then you will apply the same linear layer to, to the rows, uh, to the columns, sorry. And this is, columns are stored in registers, so there you can use uh, table lookups. So you're going to apply the same linear layer to all the uh, columns. And then you're going to add constants, and because, as I said, we are not usually not using a random constant, but a very sparse constant, and this is the case here. So you're going to add your constants only to the upper half of the first uh, uh, column. Yeah. Okay. So if you apply this algorithm that I talked about, this mapping back and forth stuff, to, to Robin and Ice Cream, it, it's going to detect some uh, invariant subspace of dimension 32. And it's also going to work for Sorrow. Yeah, Sorrow. Guess what? Also easy to mask, yeah? Because it's sorrow, I said mask. Okay. And then, so this algorithm is, is, is just detecting something, and it's actually detecting a minimal invariant subspace. But then, if you look carefully why this happens, which then is a relatively easy task, you, you will find uh, um, uh, the reason for this attack to work, and it's likely that you can improve it and uh, understand it better, and also avoid it. So here's the <coughs> invariant subspace attack for, for LS designs. <coughs> so the, the S-box <coughs> in Robin is 8-bit, and um, 
the algorithm is going to detect those eight values that are mapped to those eight, va eight values. Yeah? So this is uh, eight values which are invariant. So zero gets mapped to zero. This one gets mapped here. And actually, you find the value here again. Yeah? So this one is here. And so the whole set of values is mapped to this whole set, which is the same. Yeah? And one way of uh, you viewing this as a subspace, it's actually a three-dimensional subspace. Eight values is three-dimensional subspace. So the first bit is arbitrary, then you have an A, a B, zeros to zeros, and then the same value here again, A, a zero again, and then A plus B here. So if you check carefully, all the eight values are of this form. First bit, I don't care. These bits are zero and zero, and then this bit is zero again, and um, this bit is always identical to this bit, and the last bit is the XOR of those two bits. Yeah? <coughs> so it's a subspace, a three-dimensional subspace, mapped by the S-box to itself. Okay, how does this extend to the whole cipher? So if you start with a plain text or a state which is of this form, so it's, it's of this form, so something, some A, some B, zero, zero, the A again, and then C, which is the XOR of those two bits, A and B. Yeah? If you start with a space like this, what's going to happen uh, with the S-box layer? Nothing is going to happen to the S-box layer. Yeah? So you apply S-boxes in, 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 in the rows, and because of this thing, this property of the S-box I just showed, this means this is going to be mapped um, to something of this form again. So maybe the A is not the same and the B is not the same, so I call it alpha and beta now, but the property is the same. Yeah? And this happens for all the rows. For all the, all the rows. Yeah? So after the S-box layer, you have this state. And now what happens uh, for the linear layer? So the linear layer, remember, is applied, uh, the, the same linear layer is applied to all the uh, columns. And the first column, you don't care what's inside the first column, so if you apply the linear layer, you get something, but you don't care. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is uh, you apply it to this uh, vector with the alphas, you're going to get something. Else, something. Yeah? So I, I didn't manage in LaTeX to give this another name, but it's not the same alpha, but it's something different. But I, I didn't manage to, to, <laughs> to put the alpha prime or so. Yeah? Think about this as alpha prime. So beta, the beta vector gets mapped to some beta vector. Um, the, the zero vector, because it's a linear mapping, is mapped to the zero vector. So this will stay all zeros. This happens here again. And now the, the important thing is it's the same linear layer that's applied to this column and to this column. So the output is going to be the same. And then the zero is going to map to zero again. And because it's linear, <coughs> and this column is actually the sum of those two columns, the output is going to be the sum of the outputs, just by definition of a linear layer. So that means after the linear layer, you're again in this state. You're again, again in the state of this type. It did not destroy this property. And what happens next is you're going to XOR constants. And the problem is that you're going to XOR the constants here. The constants are only here. And this is the, the value where you don't care anyway. Yeah? It, it has been some value before, and you exit the constant, it's going to be some value afterwards, but it's not going to destroy the property. Yeah? So this is uh, why this is uh, broken with um, invariant subspaces. So that also shows that invariant subspaces are... This is not as easy as the first half of the plain text is equal to the second half of the plain text. Yeah? It's, it's more complicated. Yeah? And so it's important to have this automatic tool to detect those things. Because just looking at the cipher would make you uh, crazy, but probably not, uh, you will not find these things. Okay. Okay, natural question. Again, can we generalize this attack? Yeah, so this, this works for many ciphers, but maybe we can, we can do more. So there are many possible directions to, to think about. So the first thing you might think, maybe, so now I'm talking about probability one distinguisher. No, actually, the cipher would be broken if you have a probability of 50%. Yeah? That would still break the cipher. Yeah? Um, so a statistical variant would be interesting. Um, maybe a key recovery would be interesting. The prob problem here is that you have a probability one distinguisher for all the rounds. And this normally, uh, if you know how um, uh, key recovery attacks work for block ciphers, normally you're going to guess the last round key and... Uh, decrypt one round, and then you're going to check if, if some property holds or not. But because you, you have a probability one distinguisher for all rounds, this is not going to work. 
So this, it would be nice to get some key recovery. In some, in some uh, cases, sorry, in some cases we have a, a key recovery uh, variant, but not in all. Or the, the other uh, generalization you can think of is not to focus on subspaces yeah. only. And just say, okay, I'm, I, I don't want the subspace to be invariant, but something to be invariant, some set to be invariant. And this is the, 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 the thing I'm going to focus on now. And this is what, what we call the nonlinear uh, invariant attack. So this is uh, what we presented last uh, year in uh, AsiaCrypt. So this is joint work with uh, Yosuke Todo and Yu Sasaki from uh, Japan. It did not develop, like, like I'm presenting it now, like a natural generalization of invariant subspace, uh, of uh, yeah, invariant subspaces. But it's, it was uh, developed completely different. We tried to do something completely different, uh, which failed. And then we actually found this by coincidence, yeah? which uh, is nice. Yeah? Um, yes. So again, in the picture, this is how an invariant subspace attack works. Yeah? You have a subspace which is meant to, to itself. And now you just generalize this by saying, OK, I'm not interested in only subspaces, but some sets. Yeah? I'm going to be, I, I, I like to find a, a set which is kept invariant, mapped to itself under the round function, and if you add the key, nothing changes. This is what, what we are looking at. And if this happens for one round and all the round keys are identical, it's going to happen for all the rounds. So what could also happen is that actually those two sets get uh, in exchanged. Yeah? So that this thing is mapped here and this thing is mapped here. Yeah? That could also, but the key addition could be different than the same property. Yeah? It's just a, a yeah. Okay, so how are we going to capture this uh, uh, mathematically? So now, from now on, I think pictures are over, and it's going to be a bit more mathematical. Yeah. So uh, if you didn't follow up to this point, you're lost from now on. <laughs> if you did follow, I hope you, uh, you, you're going to uh, make it through the, the whole thing. Okay, I try to keep it simple. So, <coughs> so to keep it... Uh, to, to m what, what is the property that we want. So we are, we are given a permutation f. <coughs> this is going to be the round function of our cipher, or the whole cipher, or parts of the round function. And then we call a Boolean function, so this is just outputting 0 or 1. We call such a Boolean function a nonlinear invariant if the g applied to f of x is the same as g of x, plus a constant. Okay. This is what we are going to call a nonlinear invariant, or just an invariant for, for f. So G applied to the output of F is the same as G of, uh, applied to the input of, of, uh, of F. So what is the link to the picture? So we basically split the whole, whole space, F2 to the N, of all possible n-bit inputs into parts, namely the parts where A evaluates to 1 and the parts where, a, B, uh, where, where uh, G evaluates to 0. Yeah. So the support and the, and the complement of the support. And then the property says that this A <coughs> is invariant under F. So F of A is F, uh, F of A is A, and F of B is, is B. So it's invariant under the application of the round function. This is the case where it's, the, this constant is zero. And if the constant is one, they are just flipped. An element in A is going to be mapped to an element in B, and vice versa. Yeah. This can only happen if the, sizes, uh, the size of A and B is uh, so I'm not take, talking too much about this uh, constant here. So basically, you can focus on just this. Thing. So this ha this captures the the uh, invariant of uh, sets. So if you, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, explain in detail how you find these these things. Yeah? So um, I, I skip this part. Yeah? But there we, we, we come up again with algorithms and ideas how to find these things. Because, I mean, one important thing is it's easy to generalize all these attacks. Yeah? You just write down the most general thing you can come up with. Yeah? The problem is it's going to be useless. Yeah? You just say you want some property to hold with some probability for some rounds. Uh, this is not useful because nobody can detect these attacks, nobody can find these attacks, and nobody can uh, work with these attacks. Eh? You have to, if you want to define attacks, you, you have to also find a way to find those attacks. Eh? This, is, uh, this is what we do here in, in the paper, but I'm not going to, to uh, describe this too much. 
So the nice thing is that it actually leads to attacks to uh, Ice Cream, Midori, and Scream. Actually, only to the last version of Scream. So Scream has, is, is a candidate for, was a candidate for this Caesar competition. This uh, competition for authenticated encryption. And uh, so the first two variants were not vulnerable to this attack, and then they changed something and it became uh, vulnerable to this attack. So um, this attack, which is first only a distinguisher with probability one, actually it can be uh, uh, converted to something which is much stronger. Namely, it's a ciphertext only attack that recovers the message. It doesn't recover the key, but it allows you to uh, very efficiently uh, decrypt. So the assumption is that you're using this in, in some mode, yeah, and almost all, all modes are uh, vulnerable. Um, and the idea, the, the assumption is that you encrypt the same message multiple times, uh, which is a very mild assumption compared to all these differential attacks where you're allowed to choose the plain text. Yeah, this is uh, very mild. Uh, one idea is you, you're going to get the message encrypted and, and, and you just send an error message, please send it again, I didn't receive it, and it's going to be encrypted again and, and you're going to to uh, practically uh, be able to do this attack. And the complexity of, of, of this attack is very low. So in this table, I'm going to uh, I, I show how many weak keys you have. <clears throat> Again, it's a weak key attack, so it's not going to work for all keys, but for many. So a screen, for example, has 2 to the 128 keys, and 96 out of them are, uh, are weak. 2 to the 96 of them are weak. You will be able to recover a quarter of the bits of the message, and you will be able to do this if, if you have 33 ciphertext, so very low data complexity, and the running time is uh, 32 cube, so nothing. Because what, what, is, what, what you basically have to do is solve a linear uh, system with 32 unknowns and 32 uh, uh, equations. So this is, uh, I mean, takes zero time. And similar things happen for ice cream in Midori. Midori is a Japanese cipher that, uh, that uh, yeah, basically Japanese that uh, is supposed to be um, very energy efficient. And Midori is Japanese for green, and green like protecting the environment. Yeah? So that's, okay. Crazy names all the time. Okay. So in, in the paper, if you are interested, there are all the details that I, I left out, and I left out uh, almost all the details, and an explanation why these attacks work. So uh, you can actually prove what, or can explain what the property of the cipher is that makes this, uh, these attacks uh, possible. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so how much time do I have left? Uh, we, have, we have about uh, seven minutes left. Seven minutes left. So it's better to conclude. To stop? Uh, about three minutes for the talk and five minutes for the questions. And nobody has questions anyway. I can see I hope the they, they will ask. Okay, I'm going to talk for seven minutes and then you don't have questions. And if you have questions, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to. Okay, yeah, very briefly. So I'm going to talk about uh, how to prevent those attacks uh, now. So it's basically about choosing the constants. Yeah? So the, the only thing that's going to help you in, in protecting against these attacks is the constants. Yeah, so I'm talking about the case where all the, basically mainly the case where all the wrong keys are identical, and then the only thing that can stop this attack is uh, the wrong constant. So this is a paper that is uh, going to appear, it did not appear yet, but it's going to appear on, on, in crypto this year. <coughs> and joint work with uh, Christoph Bayer, a PhD student of mine, and Ancanto and uh, Jan Rotella from INRIA in, in Paris. Okay. So the following assumption. we, we are focusing on invariants, which are invariant. So you remember what an invariant was, like this nonlinear invariant, a function that evaluates to the same thing on the outputs and inputs. Yeah? And now I'm, I'm taking this XSL cipher or the SPN cipher, um, and I'm, I'm assuming that I have an invariant which is invariant under the S box layer and under uh, the linear layer, including the key addition. Yeah? This is not necessary. Yeah? So actually, you, you, would, you would be fine if you have an invariant, which is invariant of the whole cipher only. So it doesn't have, <coughs> nobody cares about what happens in the middle. Yeah? It's okay if it would be just invariant uh, under the whole cipher. But we are not going to find these things because we have no idea how to do, how to do this. Yeah? So the n normal way we find these things is that it's invariant under the linear layer, it's invariant under the, uh, the S-box layer. 
So this is the, the, the main assumption here. It's not a, I mean, it's a, as I just explained, it's a restriction, of course, but it's actually a restriction that's uh, true for all the attacks we found so far. Yeah. So all the attacks that are listed at the beginning of this form. Yeah. <coughs> okay. And um, so then, if you're in this setting, you can actually uh, analyze things nicer. So what are the implications of this assumption? So we have, remember, so the main thing, we have something which is invariant for the S-box layer and invariant for all these linear layers, including all the key additions. Yeah? That's the assumption. Okay. So what does it mean? So assume we have two wrong keys, no? Ki and Kj. So this is Ki and this is another wrong key, Kj, and another wrong. So the G we are looking for is invariant under uh, both these uh, linear layers with the key addition. So what does it mean? It means that G of L of X plus K, Ki is G of X plus some constant, and the same is true for uh, uh, Kj, yeah, by definition of invariant. Yeah. And if these things happen at the same time, and we assume they have to happen at the same time, then you can actually deduce that G of Y plus the sum of those two keys is g of y plus a constant. Yeah? What does it mean? It means that this is a, um, a linear structure of g. Linear structure meaning that the derivative, this is something like a der <coughs> derivative. If you move the g y here, yeah, you get g of y plus some constant plus g of y is constant. Yeah? So this is what we, what we in Boolean functions denote by a linear structure. Yeah? A derivative which is zero. So this means that this thing is a linear structure of G. No? And this should be true for all differences of all possible round keys. Yeah? All these uh, things have to be linear structures. Um, OK, and you can do more. So I mean, in, in the setting again, so we just saw that the linear structure of G, I'm going to denote this by LS of G, which actually is a subspace of uh, all the elements. This has to contain this difference of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the round keys, and you can also easily show that this has to be invariant under L. Yeah. So this is a subspace that has to contain all differences of round keys, and it's invariant under the linear layer L. Okay? And if you look at the most simple key scheduling yeah, that, I, that I'm focusing on all the time, actually, so the round keys are identical up to a round constant. Yeah. So in this case, if I look at the XOR of two round keys, it's just the XOR of these constants. Yeah? Anybody still following? Or so I can also stop if nobody's <laughs> listening anymore. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we were looking at all, in this case, we are looking at all differences of these round constants that we have. And then we have to look at the smallest subspace, which is including all these constants, and invariant under L. Yeah? This is what I'm going to uh, denote by WLD. Yeah? The smallest subspace, which is invariant under L, and containing all these differences of the wrong constants. <laughs> because if I have an attack, then this subspace must be included in the linear uh, structure of G. All, this, all these differences have to be included, and it's invariant, so all the uh, L of these things have to be included as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and now the question is, can we find a non-trivial uh, invariant G for the S-box layer? So far, I'm not talking about the S-box layer. It's only about the linear layer. Yeah? Such that I have this subspace being a, a subspace of the linear structures of G. Yeah. So what is the idea? The idea is, if, if this dimension is big, if you have a large dimensional space, a large space which is included in the linear structures, it's very unlikely that this, uh, you find a Boolean function with this uh, linear structure. So the easiest case is if the dimension is n minus 1. So I have a block cipher of dimension n, and I, I just by looking at the linear layer and my constants and the smallest invariant subspace, which is easy to compute uh, under, uh, under L, if this has dimension n minus 1, or larger, n minus 1 or n, I know that my cipher is not, uh, not uh, broken by this attack. Why? Because if I have a, a, a linear structure, uh, if I have a Boolean function g, which has a linear structure of dimension n minus 1 or n, then this actually means that g is linear. It has at least, or more precisely, it, 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 this s has a linear component. 
So, but I, I'm not going to have a linear component in my S-box uh, layer because I'm not, uh, I mean, unless you do something very stupid. Yeah? Then your S-box is not going to be, uh, not going to have a linear structure. So this is very easy to, to prove that uh, for some ciphers, LED and skinny, for example, just to, uh, and I guess, I didn't check, but I guess for, for this Russian, uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> You can do the same thing, and I'm pretty sure that the same argument uh, immediately tells you that this cipher is not going to be broken by this attack. Um, okay, so in some cases it's very easy. Uh, what to do in, in other cases? So we, we, we have a general, more general uh, theorem that actually say, tells you about what, what is the best dimension that you can uh, achieve. Yeah? So you're going to pick these wrong constants, or the differences of the wrong constants, and, and you are interested, as a designer, to make this dimension of the space as big as possible. Yeah? Because if it's uh, bigger, then it's less likely that it's going to, to be applicable. Yeah? Or in the best case, you want this to have dimension n or n minus 1, and then you're done. So we can show that actually the maximum dimension of this space containing these uh, constants, or the differences of the constants, so for t rounds, is the sum over the degree of the invariant factors of L. So invariant factor, if you don't know what this is, it doesn't matter, yeah? something. Something which is easy to compute from the linear layer. Yeah, so there's something like a rational canonical uh, normal form, and you compute this for your matrix, and then you can read uh, the degree of these uh, invariant uh, factors. Yeah? So this is uh, uh, some algebra stuff that, that, okay, that just works, and it's easy to compute. Yeah? So that means if, if, you, if, I, if you give me a linear layer for your block cipher, I can easily uh, check what are the, the, the best uh, possible dimensions for your round constants to avoid this attack. Um, so it's really uh, important to study these invariant factors of the linear layer, and this is going to explain you how many rounds you need, how many different constants you need to, to get the full dimension. It's also going to explain how you should choose your constants. And I'm not going into det in those details, but it's going to explain you how to choose them. And the nice thing is it works independently of uh, the S-box layer. Yeah? So this is really a property of the constants and the linear layer. And if you put these things together, it's going to work for any S-box. Um, so the, here's another, uh, an, another, this is the final slide, yeah? Just to... Uh, uh, we'll we start a little later than we planned, so I think we'll have about two minutes more. So okay, I need only please, one. Please continue. Um, so here, what I show here in the, on this slide is the number of constants or differences of constants on, the, on this axis and the probability that you're going to get the full space, which is 64 in this case for all these uh, ciphers. Yeah? It's all 64-bit block ciphers. So for example, for LED, even if you have one constant, the probability that you have uh, the full space with one constant is, is very high. It's not one, but it's close to one. So the, the, basically the only constant which you should not choose is the all-zero constant. Yeah? But if you choose a non or zero constant, then, then you're fine. Uh, for skinny, if you, have, uh, if you have less than four constants, you're not able to spend the whole space. Yeah? But if you have four constants, then you have a probability of roughly uh, one third that you will uh, spend the f uh, full space. So by carefully choosing the constants, you're able with four, rounds, four uh, different round constants to already spend the whole space and exclude those attacks. And then it increases, the probability increases with, uh, with more constants. And then, um, yeah, for uh, Prince and Mantis, uh, other ciphers, it looks uh, just shifted to, to this. So why is this? Because they have different linear, uh, uh, you can explain this, this picture easily by looking at the different uh, linear factors of uh, those things. It's uh, going to explain you, basically explain you why, why you get this picture. Okay. And this is uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.